Good morning, everybody. I'm, it's really a pleasure for me to be here today and talk about a topic which is always a topic of debate amongst Christians, amongst non-Christians. What is everything about? Where do we come from? What does the universe look like? And this is the study of cosmology. And uh, yesterday we talked about what, where everybody in this room comes from and actually we we found out that there's no real cosmologist amongst us. So whatever I tell, I know there is nobody who actually can really tell me that, I, that, that I'm wrong because he did not study this. <laughs> so that's, that's good to know for me. I also see a few faces that are new to me, so probably there is now a cosmology under us. I, I, so I need to still be careful with what I say. And the topic that I've chosen is, where is the boundary of cosmology theory as we know it today amongst astrophysicists? And where actually does philosophy start in the sense that where are pre-assumptions coming in that cannot be proven, but that are also part of that theory? And we have this same issue also in biology. There are things that are observed and there are things that are interpreted in a way that you cannot prove anymore, where you bring in your worldview in the way you, in, you see the things, you understand the things. And in textbooks, uh, especially in popular textbooks, this is often simply mixed up. You don't see that difference anymore. So you don't see anymore where does this, the real observation, so the hard facts that you know, where does that end? And where does the theory and the pre-assumptions start? And people actually could have made other choices if they had other things in the back of their mind. So this is what I'm trying to do in this talk. I realize, let's say within 30, 40 minutes of talking, you cannot touch on everything. So I just want to give you a little bit like a flavor of ideas and actually start a discussion on this topic. So what I've chosen to do is first give you a brief overview of this so-called hot Big Bang model, the standard cosmological model. What actually is it? Where it's come from? And then what are the observations behind that? Because the theory did not just come out of nothing. People have seen things, they have observed things and came up with this theory to describe it. But then also, where are the pre-assumptions behind this model? So where actually are things coming in that were not observed but are needed to build this theory? And based on that fact, of course, there are probably reasons why you question it. And um, I'm called this questioning the standard cosmological model. I do not call it alternatives. And there is a good reason for that because we have another talk after my talk that will talk about alternatives to the standard cosmological model. So these talks really belong together. And um, I discussed already with Andy about the content of my talk, about his talk. And what is clear, there is a certain overlap. It can't be avoided between the two talks. But we think it's very good to have this overlap because this topic is quite complicated. And seeing it from two different perspectives and two different introduction helps you also to understand it better. So don't be surprised that when, when certain things in Andy's talk come up, you say, oh, we have seen that before from Peter. This is exactly what we want to happen, okay? So let's start. The standard cosmological model. So there are a few interesting words already in the title. We're talking about cosmology. Cosmology is a science of, let's say, the universe. In particular of the large scale structure. What does that mean? Well, we all know the universe is huge compared to what we normally are used to. In cosmology, people do not start talk about planets like the Earth anymore. They do not even talk about stars because they are very small and tiny and not interesting. <laughs> they talk about galaxies and they talk about groups of galaxies and about how are those galaxies related to its other and how do they move. Um, and they talk about the universe as a whole. And if they talk about galaxies, they, they talk about the, the structure of a galaxy, but not about single stars anymore. So that's the, a very large scale of the universe. And we try to describe that with cosmological models. So a model is a description of that universe, which means that it's a, a trial to understand it by putting it into a formalism. And that's a mathematical model. We should never mix up mathematical model with reality. But we also should not doubt mathematics. If we doubt it, 
without the details of that model, and not the mathematics as itself. So therefore, the model of the universe and mathematical description, and there are several models possible, and one is better than the other, and we see a few of those things in these two talks. And this model then tries to explain, or at least understand, this large-scale structure of the universe as it is today. So does it fit to the observations that we make? But also look at it in a timely perspective. What did the universe look in the past? What did it look, will it look in the future, if you can predict that? So this is the scope of that cosmology model. And the standard cosmological model is the one that is most commonly used by astronomers. It's like a set of theories or a set of assumptions, a set of observation interpretations that most of them agree to. And if they work on a cosmological model, they normally do not work on, let's say, alternatives to the STM, but they work on the details of, them, of this model to understand it better and to improve it. So this is the background of what we are talking about here. And I first now give a brief description of this STM. Um, I'm not challenging it at the moment. I'm simply describing what this model describes. So what is the content, if you look, start, start, talk about STM, what is the content that you read, that you hear? The first thing is, this is a model that has lots to do with general real relativity theory. The theory that was developed first by Einstein and was developed further by others. And that actually relates space, time, and matter into one big theory. This is mainly or purely a theory of gravitation. On a large scale structure in the universe, one assumes that only gravitation is the force that is behind between the matter and the forces that actually determine space and time and matter is gravity. So it's a gravitational theory. An interesting thing is that there is a couple of equations that describe the general relativity. And if you solve those equations, you get an expanding universe. So the universe is not static, it's not sitting still, but it's expanding or contracting. So it's moving somehow. Something changes over time. And that's a, a, a very general statement of the general relativity theory that you have moving stuff. The next point is that there is redshift observed. I will tell, tell a little bit more about that later, but redshift means we observe that distant galaxies, the farther they are away, the more the radiation coming from those galaxies is redshifted, so the, 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 the wavelengths of that radiation is changed. And this redshift in the cosmological model standard is interpreted as an expansion, which means that actually things are stretched out in all directions an expansion of the universe. That's the interpretation of that redshift. There is also a very important observation made about the whole universe is filled with radiation. And there is a radiation that is very cold, so you can't see it. It's at a three Kelvin degree. And this radiation is everywhere. You see it in all directions. It's very isotropic. And this so-called cosmic microwave background, CMB, is considered to be a remnant of an explosion called the Big Bang. And this remnant of the explosion is uh, supposed to have occurred very long time ago, and we see that random everywhere. So this is also part of the cosmological model. So then what is the outcome of the STM? What can they tell about the universe? Very important statements. One is the universe, according to this model, has an age of roughly 13.7 million a uh, billion years and the number is sometimes a bit different but it's always in this order of magnitude another in interesting thing if you would define something like how big is the universe uh, it's very difficult to talk about the size of the universe but something in the order of magnitude of 90 billion light years and that's already an interesting thing, because you may say, OK, if the age of the universe is 13.7 billion, and it started in the beginning very small, like a Big Bang, now it actually goes out 13.7 million billion years later, it would have a size of 13.7 in one direction, 13.7 in the other direction. That's 2 times 13.7, 26, 27. 
Why is it 90? Does anybody have an idea why this number is not simply double that number but much higher? Anybody well, tries? It's inflation. Exactly. So there is an inflation in the, in the beginning, it's assumed, but also the expansion itself, the fact that it expands all the time, makes that it is larger than just the h times 2. Okay? So this is not a contradiction. That's important. The structure of the universe is supposed to be homogeneous and isotropic. I'll also come back to that later, what it exactly means. The space is curved in four dimensions due to the fact that we have matter in it. It's also very difficult for us to perceive this, and that's why these cosmological models are difficult, because if we talk about curvature in four dimensions, nobody can really understand what that means, at least not physically. You can calculate it. And this is due to the fact that we have the general relativity theory behind it, uh, which actually tells this. Then what is about the timely development? Because I said the standard cosmological model is also looking at how developed it over time. The idea behind the standard cosmological model is started with a big bang, so very small and very hot, and then it explodes. And there was an e inflationary phase where it actually it spread it up very fast. And then it spread it up normally, so it started to continue expansion. And at the moment, they observed that the expansion ex is accelerated, which is very interesting. And that means that somehow there is kind of a, a, an energy which acts stronger than gravity, because gravity tries to pull things back. And this energy is then called dark energy for a very simple reason, because nobody has any idea what it is, and you can't see it. You can only see that this expansion is accelerated, so the assumption is there must be something like that. But what it is, is a different question. And then we have one more thing, which is the dynamics of galaxies. Galaxies are grouped in clusters, and they are like, they belong together. And also within a galaxy, those nice spiral things, you see the dynamics of those galaxies. Um, turns out that actually, if they are stable, that's the assumption, if they are stable, then actually there must be more in those galaxies than the matter that we see, and actually a lot more. And this is called dark matter. So this is actually the, like a summary of this uh, standard cosmological theory. And let's now have a look. This is a picture that you can see very often. You find it in the internet everywhere. So somebody really made some work to explain to us in one picture what the universe looks like. And this is like, this is the timely development in that direction. We start with a Big Bang here. You see it very nicely, it's the Big Bang. And you see this inflation where suddenly the universe really expands very, very fast. And then it starts to expand normally. And that after a certain time, actually, in the beginning, the universe is filled with radiation and with uh, matter all mixed up. So like really a soup of matter and, and uh, energy. And everything is light. And then after a certain time, they say about 400,000 years after the beginning, this actually splits up. So um, matter and radiation actually come apart. And from that point on, we can see at a later stage into that time. So that is how far you can look back in time. It's to that point. And that's exactly what they say where this cosmic radiation comes from. And through the expansion of the universe, this radiation cools down to the very low temperature that we have now of only three degrees. Then after a certain time, matter starts to build stars, stars start to get into galaxies, and that's finally the universe that we see at the moment. The expansion continues all the time, and at the moment it's even accelerating, and that is actually demonstrated by this going further out faster at the end of this picture. So this is the standard cosmological model as it is normally shown. So what is the, the real observational evidence? So what drives cosmologists to have this notion of our universe? So a very important basic observation is this redshift observation. Okay, so we have this redshift. What does the redshift mean? We observe spectra for galaxies from stars, but in, it's particularly from galaxies. And we see that they look reddish, to put it in a very simple way. And the farther they are, the more reddish they look like. 
So there is a correlation like the further away the radiation is more red. And this redshift is actually interpreted as an expansion of the universe. So you can say they, they fl flee away from us at an even increasing speed, but you can also say that the universe is stretched up. The space is stretched up, and this is actually what the general real relativity theory tells you. Um, I don't have a picture with me here, but you, you remember probably those pictures you may have seen of a balloon. If you boost up a balloon, it's very small in the beginning, and you, you draw dots on the balloon, in the beginning they are close, and then you push up the balloon, and you see that the, all, all the points are starting to move away from each other in, in all directions because of this expansion. And this is the interpretation of that redshift, is the expansion. So that's one very basic, important observation and interpretation behind the uh, sub, uh, standard cosmological model. So the background radiation is, as I said, is interpreted as a, as a remnant of this, this big explosion at the beginning, the Big Bang. And this is, turns out to be extremely uh, homogeneous and isotropic, which means that no matter in which direction you look like in the sky, you find this radiation very precisely at this temperature um, of 2.7 Kelvin, which is minus 270 degrees Celsius, very cold, but very precise at that temperature. And it took a while before people realized that actually there is kind of a fluctuation in this radiation, but they're very small fluctuations, so like the tiny changes. But these changes are now interpreted as very being very important to understand the structure of the universe. And you see this here, like uh, the, the, the red points are the ones where the temperature is a bit higher, like in the fifth decimal point, there is one more <laughs> in that order of magnitude, and also lower temperature as the blue here, and average temperature as green. And this is now like, okay, we are looking that far back in time, and we see this picture. So this is what the university looked like in terms of its structure, that very long time ago. And then there was an, an, an assumption that if that is the case, does this picture actually relate to what we see as structure in the universe in terms of where are the galaxies, how do they concentrate? And this is indeed found. So galaxies are not spread uniformly through the universe. They are organized or actually put in string-like structures. So you see that actually they, they clump together in structures. And these structures have been shown to correspond to these fluctuations in the cosmic background. And that is part of the theory as well, that we say, okay, this, this background shows how the universe looked that far away or that long ago. And the structure, how the galaxies are structured in the universe, fits exactly to what we see there as a picture. This was considered to be a further proof that its theory is correct. A picture of one galaxy, it's the nearest by galaxy apart from our own galaxy. Our own galaxy we cannot make a picture of outside because we are sitting in the middle of it. <laughs> so uh, therefore we need to look at other galaxies to look how they look like. It's the Andromeda galaxy. Um, it has a distance of a few million light years from, our, our, from us and we see the very nice spiral structures. But I already said, when, when astronomers or cosmologists talk about galaxies, they more or less look alike, where are more galaxies? And here is a very nice picture of Hubble, the so-called deep, deep field picture, which means that Hubble tries to find spots where there are uh, not so much stars from our galaxy that actually are disturbing the picture. And they look through that uh, empty, empty uh, space and then make pictures where you see a lot of different galaxies. And so that the, the whole universe is full of galaxies. There is an estimate that there are roughly 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe. So that's a good number to remember, 10 to the 11 galaxies. And also each of those galaxies on average contains one to the uh, 10 to the 11, so 100 billion stars, okay? So 100 billion stars in every galaxy and 100 billion galaxies in the visible universe, the ones that we can observe because we see their radiation coming to us. So this already gives also a little bit of the size of the thing that we are talking about here. And if you then start mapping those, all those galaxies that are measured in structures, so this is now like 
a round vision from Earth, where we see in the middle our own galaxy, uh, because that's what we see from our galaxy, because we are in sitting in the middle of it. And we see how all those galaxies are structured. You see that this, this is not a, a homogeneous distribution in itself, because we see those structures. And this structure that we see here is then linked very nicely to this cosmological background. And um, in order to find this, that those two are very nicely connected, um, there have been very big simulations made, computer simulations, that say, okay, if we start with this cosmological background picture, and we put like mass points on all those hot points, and say this, this is where the mass was in the beginning, um, and then they let this develop with all the theory that they have, this was the illustrious simulation, then at the end we find um, very precisely the structure of the universe with the, with the galaxies that we have today. And that's where this statement comes from, that the two actually are nicely connected to each other. Okay, so far about the theory itself. Let me come to the issues. Um, because some of those issues with the, uh, with the standard cosmological model are very nicely, uh, today, very nicely presented in the internet. Uh, you can look it up. Um, so if, you, if my talk is not long enough or you want more details, I have a number of uh, YouTube um, videos and um, Wikipedia uh, readings so that you don't have to buy, let's say, expensive books and understand a lot of physics. Uh, you can do that today, actually learn very fast from those things. And I brought one on the, two, the first two problems. So let me briefly explain what it is about. There is a so-called um, statement that the universe has very amazing properties that cannot be explained by the standard cosmological model in itself. So they need further assumptions. One is this, the, the thing that the universe is flat. And the other thing is the fact that the universe is isotropic. One is called the flatness problem, the other is the horizon problem. And the video that I'm going to show is actually explaining how cosmologists today try to avoid those problems or try to explain those problems. And there's another one which is not touched in that video, which is that the parameters of physics are highly fine-tuned. I come to that in a second. So we're now looking at some of the pre-assumptions behind the cosmological model to see actually were actually are people not finding anything, but they simply assume things. And which assumptions go into this model? And the first assumption is the so-called cosmological principle. This is actually the statement that the Earth has no reason for being in a special place. This idea has, of course, a worldview pre-assumption behind it. The worldview is God does not exist, so there is nothing like creation, which means life is purely accidental, so why should we be in a specific position in the, in the universe? If you are not in a specific position, but just randomly chosen somewhere, actually, we can assume that the universe, no matter where you are, looks the same. Okay, so this is the background behind that principle. So the short version is, we are not special, therefore we are not in a special position. And then we can assume the universe is homogeneous. There is, by the way, another principle, which is called the anthropic principle, that needs to be taken into account as well. There are a lot of cosmologists that say, well, be careful here, because um, even if we do not know, uh, do not believe in God, and we do not believe in creation, we still believe that we are here, as we are here, which means that the universe could well look different in a different position, but that is then a position where life cannot exist. So we are probably in a special position simply because life cannot exist in other parts of the universe. Okay, that's the anthropic principle. So please keep those two apart. Um, still, all, all cosmologists actually normally assume this homogeneity that no matter where you are in the universe, it will look the same. This is different from the so-called isotropic principle, but that means it's the same if you look in different directions. So when I stand on the Earth and I look in all directions globally, I will roughly see the same thing. Now, we must, must be careful. This is something you can observe, the isotropy, because you can do that from the Earth. This is something you cannot observe because we cannot go anywhere else to look whether that's true or not. So this remains a pure assumption 
This is an assumption that can be proven, and it has been proven, by the way. So the isotropy is really observed, and it is true. The homogeneity remains an assumption. And that's simply because we are fixed in our universe where we are. The Earth is part of the solar system. The solar system is part of the, let's say, nearby group of stars that we really can say they are in our neighborhood. And then that, that solar system group with these nearby stars is roughly on two thirds away from the center of our galaxy, our Milky Way. By the way, a perfect position to be in. If we would be closer to the center, we would have too many stars around us. Night would not be dark anymore. And also a lot of radiation would be there that would be dangerous for life. If we would be further out, we would sit less stars in the sky. Okay, so the, the night would be really dark without any stars or with only a few stars. Um, so this gives us a perfect view to the outer world. We can look outside of our galaxy. We can look, see the, the other galaxies, for instance. We still see the, the, the stars around us, so we have a very beautiful place to be, which I think is not accidental. Some other things it is. <clears throat> then this, our own Milky Way is part of what we call a local galactic group of galaxies that group together in a group. Um, so we are sitting here, and there are other galaxies around us. For instance, this Andromeda uh, galaxy is one of the galaxies in the local group. And these groups, this local group is again, together with other groups, grouped together in the Virgo cluster group of galaxies. So we go to even larger scales all the time. And this local group, uh, th this Virgo supercluster group is then um, one of many other clusters. So you see this clustering everywhere. And that's all what we also see on a previous picture, that there is clustering in the universe. And therefore, only at the very highest scale, this homogeneity can be, let's say, assumed. On all smaller scales, it's definitely not seen. Okay, so we already have seen that inflation is one of the theories that solves this problem of flatness and horizon, if it is true. But it is, at the moment, a pure assumption. There is no physical theory behind it. The only thing that is saying, if this inflation took place, we have two problems solved at once. That's the statement. It's not a statement. This is the theory that explains it. The multiverse theory is another one, which is a little bit aside of the standard cosmological model, but I still want to explain it briefly. You may have heard about multiverse many times. The, f the problem is the following. We have this fine tuning of the physical parameters. Everything fits together. We have matter, we have light, we have radiation, we have life that can exist. And physicists have found out that, that this fine tuning of physics is a very high fine tuning in the sense that if one of those parameters will be a little bit different, everything would go wrong. We would either have only radiation in the universe or it would be completely dark, no matter would exist, all these type of things. So everything would go wrong immediately. And there are estimates that the number of let's say, pure theoretical combinations of physical parameters that could exist is a very high number. You see here a number of 10 to the 700. So you say, okay, how can it be that our universe has exactly the right one picked out of 10 to the 700? And, well, that's difficult. If I say, well, God knew exactly what he was doing, I'm done. And I think that is the case. But if you do not believe that, what kind of theory do you have? And they say, well, Probably we are not the only universe. All those other 10 to the 700 minus 1 universes exist as well, either after each other or in parallel. We can't see them. It's a pure assumption. But if all of those exist, then also the one we are in exists. And life would get into existence in this one, because in all the others it would not work. And there we are, problem solved. Okay? So, if you heard about multiverse theory, do not think it's an observational thing and we, there are many universes. It's simply the naturalist alternative for creation. Okay? So then we have those two things with dark matter and dark energy. And that's a very interesting thing. We've seen that galaxies are dynamically moving. They are grouped in clusters and they turn around or they circle around, they evolve or re revolve all the time. And this observation is very interesting because 
if you start measuring the rotation speed of galaxies and the, the speed that they have relative to each other, you see that they are somehow linked together gravitationally. And then you start calculating, OK, how much matter do I need to have enough gravitation energy to keep them together? You certainly find out, oh, wait a second, there is not enough matter that we find. There is matter missing, and this is then called dark matter. So dark matter is not is matter we cannot see. That's why it's called dark. But it's also called dark because we have no idea what it is. If you have time, you will get this presentation. Anyhow, somewhere uh, there is another interesting video from Physics Girl about dark matter, which is also hilarious, funny, and uh, explains very nicely what it is. So again, we have something that we in implicitly find, which is not explained by the STM. And that has a big question mark around it. What is it? What can it be? It's even worse with this accelerated um, um, expansion of the universe. This is observed by measuring distances to supernovae. And the theory behind it is a little bit complicated. But one finds that the expansion of the universe seems not to slow down, but it seems to increase. And this is what you would not expect based on gravitational uh, um, forces. And therefore, this force field, a stronger force field than the gravity, somehow must be available if the STM is true. And then they call this dark matter, uh, dark energy. And they found that this is a very large portion of the energy in the universe must be of this kind to actually keep against the gravity and expand the universe at an accelerating rate. It's also a nice video there from the Fraser Cain University today, a universe today that explains it very well, if you want to look further into that. Now, there is another assumption behind the universe, uh, behind the SCM, about the origin of the universe. I mean, this is the final question of all. Where did everything come from? Now that we have the whole theory, we start with the Big Bang. Where did that come from? What was before the Big Bang? Can you ask that question? Did time exist before that? Did space exist? What, what happened? So this is what many are struggling with, cosmologists. And they have the feeling, if you can answer that question, then we have finally made it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there are so-called quantum fluctuations of vacuum. Your question before, which one of the ideas? They say, OK, everything is empty, dark, no matter, nothing is there. This is called what we call a vacuum, nothing. And then there's fluctuations in there. And then suddenly, there is a big fluctuation, randomly. And wow, there off it goes, the Big Bang. Uh, now, <clears throat> even if that would be possible and true, which I doubt personally, um, this still assumes that there is kind of, we call it a space-time foam. So something must be there. But there's no space-time. And there must be at least physics laws that actually then rule what happens afterwards. So there is still an assumption about something to exist, even if it is no matter and no time and no light. This must exist as well. Because if that not, does not exist, it cannot come to existence. Now, when, when I talk about creation by God, I'm also talking about creating the physical laws so that they work nicely the way they do. And this is, by the way, assumed here. So this is not saying you have creation out of nothing, as it's often stated. It's creation out, out of an existing vacuum with some properties that are needed to make it happen. The other thing uh, where people move away this beginning issue is that they call about this multiverse. And they say, OK, well, our universe will finally end somehow in certain form, whatever it is. And then there is another one coming up. And there is another one coming up after each other, in parallel to each other. So actually, they say everything exists for eternity. There is no beginning, there is no end, and we're just in one phase of that. And therefore, for us, it looks like a beginning. In reality, there was no beginning. Well, this is, of course, moving away the problem, because then you have to explain where all these infinity uh, explosions and so on come from and how. So it's not a real solution. It's just an option that's being discussed. Another one interesting is a quasi-steady state universe. Say the universe also ex exists for eternity. And it's, it's expanding, yes, that's true. But all the time, there is matter being created within that universe. So it expands and gets filled up with matter all the time. And that continues forever. 
Um, it, of course, also does not solve the problem. For this question, what is the origin of everything? What is the origin of the universe? There is no answer whatsoever. Okay? So this is an unknown one. And therefore, I think there are good reasons to start questioning this STM. Why should one look for alternatives? And by the way, it's not only Christians that look for alternatives. Also, many cosmologists, they know that actually they need something else, something better. Because there is so much assumptions in there and so much actually things that they do not understand that this seems a theory that is not really complete. So we have seen the or origin is unknown. We have the flatness. We have the horizon problem. We have this fine tuning of physics. We have an accelerating expansion and we have the dark matter. And all these things are not really part of the theory. They are needed to make the theory work, put into it. So there, therefore there are pure scientific reasons for looking at alternatives. And they are all valid. And a lot of cosmologists actually work on this. They are not, come, not really very happy with the existing theory and they say we need to come up with something better. There also can be observational reasons because some of the, let's say, normal observations that we have from galaxies and so on seem not really to fit exactly to this model. One of the observations that is often recalled in, by astronomers and, and um, creation uh, believers among Christians is this so-called quantized redshift that actually the redshift is not a very smooth uh, observation but that many um, many galaxies have redshifted that are actually spiked around certain values of redshift. Now there is a lot of debate, ar debate around this. Um, I think uh, Andy you will talk a little bit more about that so I'll limit it down at the moment. Uh, but it, it, this, is, this is going on for a long time, this debate, and some say that is, it is true, and some say it is wrong, and it's very difficult for me as a layman, although I'm an astrophysicist, to really judge about this, okay? But it's a thing that, that needs to be considered as well when we talk about alternatives. And then we have that sometimes galaxies uh, are not where we would expect them. For instance, um, in the Big Bang theory, we have that the... the um, the young galaxies, young in the sense that, that they are not so evolved in, in their dynamics, we expect that we see them far away because then we also look far away back in time, so they are young. And the, the, the galaxies that are closer to us, we expect to be old because they already have that big age. But sometimes we find young galaxies and they are too close to what you normally would expect. So there is a question mark there as well. There are further observations. I cannot list them all. So just to give you an idea that not everything fits nicely to this Big Bang theory. And of course, we as Christians, we may have also worldview reasons to doubt this Big Bang. Because all those pre-assumptions behind the theory, do they really need to be true? Or do we have alternatives there? The first, probably the most debated one, if the universe was created, must it really be that old? Can it not be much young, younger? Uh, because creation is something that we cannot really grab. Things may look old, but are young indeed. Um, and the second thing is this Big Bang itself. It's just what we call a singularity, a point in space and time and whatever it is. Is that really physics? 10 to the minus 32 size of the whole universe? Or it's something that also many cosmologists themselves doubt. They say, isn't there a way to circumvent that? It may have been smaller in the beginning, but must it have been that size? And then also about the homogeneity, which is an assumption, that it is isotropic, okay, but if it is not isotropic, what could, uh, not homogeneous, what alternatives do that bring to us? Um, I have one more slide, especially on this age issue. Because this is the thing that I always get asked for. Okay? You as a Christian, do you really believe the universe is that old? And I'm, uh, I was grown up in a Christian environment where I was told the earth, the universe, is 6,000 years old. And I believed that when I was young. And when I started studying physics and astronomy, my goal was to finally prove that this is true. Okay? Um, <clears throat> I'm now 58. I still didn't prove that. And therefore, I think it's important to make a few remarks on that. 
Um, it's clear that we want to do that because we, we understand that God created things. And if he created things, he can do that anytime, in any form, and therefore we cannot judge about ages anymore because he could have uh, created the, the, the world like yesterday and it looks exactly like it is today. He can do that. And I remember I had discussions during my study with uh, other students and they were telling me that exactly that. Yeah, you believe in God, you can assume that God created the earth yesterday and where's the problem? You can believe that if you want, but I don't believe that, they say. And therefore, also many alternative cosmologies coming from Christians, they look into this issue. They try to somehow use the general relativity and actually reduce the time by looking at how can we expand the universe. And on the Earth, it looks like, from, from us, it looks very old, but in reality, it was very young. So these type of theories are around there, and we need to consider those. So for instance, the edge is then very old, but on the, on the Earth, it's young, and so on. And since Andy will talk more about, about that, I will leave that up to him to talk more about that. But here I want to give merely a few thoughts that have become important to me. Um, first of all, uh, it's not only this large size of the universe. It's also other observations that indicate very high ages that make it difficult for me to, to say, okay, maybe it's, it's all young. And one of those is that if you look at the development series of stars, they fit so nicely to, the, to what we observe from stars, on, of their chemical evolution, of their size. There is this so-called hatsprung russell diagram, and um, I have brought a picture of that here. Uh, it means that a star, if it evolves over its life, it, it life, it gets burning on the so-called main sequence, which is actually telling what's the temperature, what's the size uh, or, or the luminosity of the star. And it's burning on that main sequence, and then when it, at the end of its life, it actually explodes, and, be, and it moves into this diagram. And if you look at global or crust clusters, and this or the picture on the right is one of those, you have a lot of stars that are assumed to have come into existence roughly at the same time, because they are in a global or cluster, so they all belong together. They have similar properties, but some of them um, actually, if they are more massive, they evolve faster, which means that on the top right side, they start moving away from that main sequence earlier, and, and others that are, have longer lives, they stay longer on that main sequence, and therefore on the lower hand you see that main sequence, because those are the stars that live longer. On the upper hand, they have moved away. So all these observations fit so nicely to the theory that I can hardly think that it's accidental. And we have uh, an expert in the room on this topic. So if you want to know more about it, Anke is looking at old stars and looks exactly at these type of relations in her doctor thesis. Um, <clears throat> another one point is very important that is we see a lot of galaxies that actually are somehow, they have met each other. And they are gravitationally um, breaking up each other. They are colliding. But if galaxies collide, Actually, a galaxy exists of many different stars, so they move through each other, but the gravitational forces disturbs the whole form of the galaxy. And so we have pictures like this. They are, they are about to collide, and th those actually have already start disturbing uh, themselves. Another one on the right hand, there are thousands of those pictures. And there are a lot of model simulations that say, okay, if I start with two galaxies, now let's move them together, how do they actually move? And you find exactly these type of structures coming to existence. So this is exactly the behavior you would expect. Now the time scales that you need for that, they are in the order of several billion years to do that because galaxies do not move that fast. Well, they do move fast, but they are very big. So they really take a long time to go through a process like that. And therefore, these are also indications of a very long age unless you start assuming things like, well, God created them exactly in that form, so they looked like they were moving through each other, but in reality they didn't because they were exactly created like that. But that brings me back to the first assumption that I made, is God could have created everything yesterday and it would look like exactly this. Of course, I can always solve a problem like that, but for me as a scientist, that does not really look convincing. And th there is one example that I helped, helped me a lot uh, on explaining this. Um, and I was discussing this with Norbert Pyler. He's a scientist in, uh, in Germany as well, a Christian scientist. 
And they say, if I, would, if, if I would meet Adam the day after he has been created, um, now, now the real Adam, the first man on the world, okay. <laughs> if I would meet him today, and yesterday he was created, but I do not know. I say, good morning, Adam. <laughs> How old are you? Adam would say, well, I'm 32 years old. Uh, so yeah, I can see that. Yeah? So because that's by interpretation of his personality. And he said, Adam, no, you were wrong. I was created yesterday. Oh, wait, I made a mistake. Uh, because creation actually that disturbs our view on what age is. But now I, I'm going to ask him another question. I said, Adam, when you were a child, what did you do? And he starts telling me stories about what he did as a child. And I said, wait a minute. He never was a child. Where do these memories come from? Did God him, give him these memories of a child? So he, he has the idea that he is old, but in reality he is not. I would... I would see that as a contradiction for myself. I would say, no, he can't have memories of his childhood because that was like God is actually teasing us and telling us something that did not really happen. And that is actually the fact here. We see things that look like they have happened, like a supernova explosion in the Andromeda Nebula. We can observe that. But that is several million years away. So if we assume that this was created only a few a short term ago, that would mean that this explosion never did really place. We only see, and for us it looks like it took place, but it did not really take place. And I personally have a, 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 a problem with that. I, I can't believe that God is like that, teasing us that way. And that is the reason why I actually cannot believe that the universe is young, because of those reasons. But it's my personal opinion. Anybody else can have another opinion. I also do not think that for us as Christians, this is really making a big difference in terms of what we are believing. We are believing that Jesus is the Lord. And that's much more important than the age of the universe. And it does not actually, for me, work as a contradiction. So I'm also looking forward to your talk, Andy, on, on those, some of those alternatives and on your view on that. So, but this was my perspective, per perception on this. So to make it very brief, conclusions, I think we have seen it. The cosmological model explains a few of our observations very well. That's the reason why it is the standard cosmological model. But many things are not understood and need improvement or probably a whole new theory. There are many independent observations that indicate that the universe is old. And that means that if we look at alternatives, or not only we, but also cosmologists, if they look at alternatives, they need to explain this and they need to explain this, and probably some of this as well, because then they are a better theory. It's always so if you come up with a new theory, it must explain what already was explained before, and a little bit more. Then you have a better theory. And this is a real challenge. I don't have any, so I cannot tell you what the, what the truth is, and what needs to be changed from STM to make it happen. So I leave it at that point. Thank you very much for listening, and I think we have time for questions.